Hi everybody and thanks for coming along to our third webinar, I think it is, of the year. Uh, this time I'll be joined by Professor, or joined with, uh, Professor Harvard Helgen. He's from the Biomaterials Group, the Institute of Clinical Dentistry, from the Faculty of Dentistry at the University of Oslo in Norway. So like always, or nearly always, this will be a two-part webinar where I give the introductory part before handing this over uh, to Harvard for the main part. So today's talk, the webinar is entitled Advances in Bone Tissue and Bone Material Interface Characterization. So uh, Harvard will be talking a lot about how he's used our OPTIR tool, together with some other analytical techniques and some contrast of those to those other analytical techniques. Uh, and maybe a couple of uh, housekeeping rules or pointers. Uh, throughout this talk, uh, you can, of course, ask questions or type your questions in, so please type them into the chat box. We'll certainly have some time at the end and we'll uh, get through as many of those as we can. Anything that we can't get through, we'll uh, endeavor to get back to you within a few days via email. Uh, this is also a recorded webinar. So again, within a few days at the completion of the webinar, an email will go out uh, with the recording details so you can share this with anyone who uh, may be interested or maybe wasn't able to attend. Uh, and I think that's probably all from a housekeeping perspective, so I'll jump straight uh, into it. Uh, from an outline perspective, I'll uh, start off by giving a quick overview of vibrational spectroscopy, which of course encompasses IR, or most commonly FTIR, together with uh, also Raman. And I'll be contrasting their pros and cons. Um, I'll then be introducing how OPTIR works at, at a pretty high level and how it basically overcomes uh, all of the issues that I'll be going through as they relate to traditional IR and, and Raman uh, spectroscopy techniques. Um, I'll then give you uh, a fairly quick summary of a broad range of applications, not just bio or, or, bio or bone related applications, to give you a bit of a sense and a feeling of how and where OPTR is being used. I'll, ba I'll base most of these off existing publications. Uh, and then uh, in the second half of this webinar, of course, I'll hand over to Professor Harvard Hogan, and he will then will go into in depth into how he's used. Uh, this particular tool and technique in his line of research, again, based off uh, his his recent publication in this field. So uh, I'm going to assume most of you are familiar with vibrational um, spectroscopy. So to say that it's all about functional groups. I mean, each peak, of course, is um, uh, representative of a particular functional group. And it's been, it's been used for decades across a huge and wide uh, range of application areas. However, it has been around for a while. It is quite a mature technology, uh, and it, it, it is really at the limits, its fundamental limits. Um, and, and primarily, it's all about spatial resolution because we're using long wavelengths in the, infra, in the, in the infrared. Those traditional techniques, such as the FTIR and some of these emerging uh, QCLs that employ long wavelengths, are limited sort of 10 to 20 micron uh, region. Uh, other issues are that you know, the best spectra are obtained in transmission mode, but for that you need to cut them quite thin, 5 to 20 microns at most. Uh, but cutting things thinly is, is sometimes difficult or, or often even impossible. Uh, in those cases, you may be using a micro ATR, such as the one pictured here, uh, but that requires contact, it's difficult to position, there's contamination concerns, the crystal and all the sample can be damaged. Uh, so there are some uh, challenges there, and that's, and here's, here's an example of how the sample surface can be damaged with an ATR. Uh, these systems often, nearly always, require liquid nitrogen cooling, which is a bit of a hassle to handle. Uh, but one of the, you know, what I consider the underappreciated uh, issues with these sort of traditional FTIR and QCL sort of direct microscopes um, is these dispersive and scatter artifacts. So imagine you have a thin film of a polymer, let's say a PMMA thin film, you measure that in transmission, you get a lovely looking spectrum, nice flat baseline, symmetric peaks, all looking good. But if you take the exact same material and make that into a bead, 15 micron bead in this example, measure that in transmission, well, the spectrum now looks very different. Baseline offset, you've got weird baselines, peaks are shifted and they split, change the shape, keep the material the same, the spectrum looks different, Yet again, so it really goes to show how spectra can be very, very much particle shape, size, and even surface roughness dependent, uh, in addition to any chemical differences. Uh, so you've got to be very mindful of that. But when it comes to Raman, by far the biggest, biggest issue is autofluorescence, and that can often swamp the signal. You can mitigate some of that by going to longer wavelengths, but then you take a massive, massive hit on sensitivity, and that's on, on top of an already limited sensitivity that's just inherent 
and fundamental to Raman spectroscopy. Uh, you can't collect single frequency, you must collect hyperspectral, which and I'll talk more about single frequency imaging in, in, in the coming slides, but you know, full hyperspectral imaging can be relatively slow. Uh, there's power sensitive and power issues. Uh, because it is a low sensitivity technique, you're typically wanting to put in as much power as possible and it ends up being a fine balance between uh, as much power for best sensitivity versus minimizing or ID having absolutely no sample damage. Uh, and then there's the issue of that the Raman spectrum themselves can be dependent on the excitation wavelengths. Uh, this could be sort of sample related with uh, particular um, resonances, visible resonances uh, that may be excited in the sample. Um, for example, um, dyes uh, or, or inks, uh, for example, can, can have some strong resonances. It could also be the substrate. Glass, for example, doesn't work very well with 785. Right. Um, so all of those issues, I'm you, know, you probably have experienced some or most of those. All of those have pretty much gone away completely when, when dealing with optical photothermal infrared as a technique. OPTI is a pump probe optical spectroscopy technique where the pump is an infrared laser. That's the one that excites the sample. The probe is the short wavelength, typically a green 532 or, or a near infrared laser. And it's the probe, and it's through the probe beam that we detect uh, the the effect of the absorbances, the infrared absorbances. Uh, so with OPTI, we, we're delivering Raman-like spectral resolution, but with the richness of, of the infrared spectral uh, region. Um, we, we operate primarily in reflection mode, though certain applications do require transmission, but even in, in reflection mode, we end up generating transmission, FTIR transmission-like or FTIR ATR-like spectra in reflection mode. So none of the, the typical distortions, artifacts or fringes uh, that you might get uh, with FTIR when operating in reflection mode. It's non-contact, I mean, we've already mentioned that. And the spatial resolution uh, is actually independent of the wavelength. So it's constant across the entire wavelength. Uh, so how does it we'll do all of that? How does it seemingly magically do all of that? Uh, well, we, we at the heart of this is a QCL laser, a quantum cascade laser that's uh, pulsed. Uh, we're sending that pulse beam through a reflective cascade objective, the sort of the, the sort you'd find on most FTI microscopes. We focus it down as tightly as we can, and that's only about 10 microns because it's, these are long wavelengths. At the same time, we co-linearly introduce a visible beam, or, or an eye, but typically a visible 532, and that being the short wavelength laser, we can focus that down really tightly to, to about half a micron, or even less, depending on the objective. And it's really that uh, is where the uh, spatial resolution enhancements come from. Um, and as we're tuning the infrared wavelength from one end of the spectrum across the other end of the spectrum, uh, we we're actually monitoring the green reflected light. Right, so when the infrared wavelength matches a particular absorbance band, the sample momentarily heats up, cools down as it's pulsing, uh, and that changes. We get some thermal expansion, we get some refractive index change, and that changes how the green light is reflected back. So again, we synchronize the monitor the green uh, in, 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 as a function of infrared um, wavelength tuning. And from that, you, you end up with, with what is essentially a pure infrared spectrum. And taking advantage of a, of a really useful property of Q cells, and that's the ability to tune to a single frequency, a wavelength, wave number, um, you can then hone in on particular bands of interest, be it a carbonyl or some C CO stretching or maybe a CA stretch. And then you end up generating images that are very specific to that particular function. And that, of course, is much faster than hyperspectral imaging. Uh, so speaking of modes, uh, one of the simple modes is really just point and shoot. If that's your field of view, you can mark spots and, and collect spectra. And each one of these uh, spectra will come from about a half a micron spot size. You can work in a ray mode where you can draw a line. You can collect a line of spectra with a minimum step size of 50 nanometers, or you can work in a, a traditional mapping mode where you draw a grid and you end up with a with a three-dimensional data cube. I call this discovery mode because that's great for when you really don't know what might be changing. But if you do know what you change, what might be changing, I, I call this targeted um, uh, targeted mode imaging. You can employ single frequency imaging. So rather than collecting the entire stack of images, you can collect only certain discrete frequencies. That's, of course, much faster. Uh, in this slide here, I'm going to attempt to compare and contrast traditional IR, and I'm going to lump uh, FTIR and some of these emerging QCL microscopy techniques into the one bucket. I'm going to compare that with Raman against a whole host of uh, Q 
key microscope um, characteristics or, or attributes. Uh, first one being uh, spatial resolution. And if you care about that, typically Raman is going to be your, your choice. In thread, as we know, traditional thread has this poor spatial resolution. If you're worried about fluorescence, of course, Raman is poor with that, and, and IR has no fluorescent issues. Spectral sensitivity, um, IR will win that race, and that kind of ties into speed of measurement as well. Uh, when it comes to the ex extensiveness of libraries or the spectral interpretability, it's important to, to remember, or if you don't know, to be made aware of the fact that commercial libraries out there have uh, about 10 times as many infrared libraries or infrared spectra in their libraries as they do RAM. So there's a, there's a huge wealth and depth of, of database out there in, in the infrared. So I'm giving that a green and, and RAM is much, much less. Uh, if you want to work in reflection mode, which is the easy mode of operating, it's kind of point and shoot. A sample prep isn't really so much of an issue. Raman's great for that. IR is really poor when it comes to any reflection work. Water vapor can be an issue with IR, not with Raman. Water solvents, if you're working with live cells, for example, traditional IR is a real pain for that. Uh, Raman's great. Glass mostly works well with Raman, does not at all with infrared. Uh, and this idea of, of having the spatial resolution being wave independent, well, traditional IR. It's not at all, but with Raman it is. So if you look at that, it's no wonder, it's no surprise that uh, most labs will have one of each instruments. Depending on the needs of the experiment, you may go to one, you may go to the other, or you may even take the same sample and measure them on both instruments. And then of course, there's the challenge of, of finding the exact same measurement spot. Well, well, what we do with OPTIR is we take all of those and literally put them into one instrument. So you know, when, I, when, when I say it combines the best of both of, of traditional IR and Raman into a single platform, I actually mean that quite literally. Um, now, at the heart, I think I've mentioned the heart of this, uh, we at the beginning of all of this is, is the infrared light source, and that's the QC on this case. So um, there, are, there have been some developments in, in those over the last year or so. Uh, our, the traditional or our, our standard QC covers an 1800 to 950, and that's done with three chips, these three sort of mini lasers within the one box. Um, if you're interested in some of the higher wave number um, areas, you can, you can opt for an additional OPO laser, that's 3600 to 2700. Uh, my favorite, uh, the most interesting things for me are these sort of more custom, cute and technical, I'm not sure you call them custom anymore, they become quite mainstream. Uh, the, it's the CH chip in particular that I'm quite excited about, the 3000 to 2700. And you can add that as your fourth um, chip, because you can house up to four chips in these, in these boxes. And that gives you this range. And that, so that really covers the key functional groups uh, in, in the mid-infrared spectrum. If you're interested in the silent region, you can perhaps replace the CH with the silent region chip. Or if you're interested in the long, long wave end, the low wave number in the spectrum, uh, you can opt for your fourth chip to be that one, in, in which case you can go down to about 1800. Uh, your, in terms of probe, and the probe, of course, doubles as your Raman excitation laser, you can opt for a 532 or a 785. Uh, it's important to compare, I think, just to really appreciate that uh, OPTIR spectra are indeed very much compatible and comparable to the decades of FTIR history and libraries out there. So in this slide, I'm going to um, compare reflection, sorry, uh, transmission FTIR data that have been collected in transmission mode of thin films. So these, are, these are library spectra. And I'm going to compare them to the same material but collected in reflection mode of a thick block, probably some millimeters, with OPTIR. So in this, so first example is polypropylene. The red is the FTIR thin transmission reference, and OPTIR is our thick reflection measurement. As you can see, that's a spot-on match. Same thing with polyethylene, PET, nylon, and polystyrene. Right? And the, and the spectra here are in no way um, treated, transformed. These are literally raw spectra that you would get on the screen. Spatial resolution is something we talk a lot about. It's important to understand perhaps some basic fundamentals here. Uh, spatial resolution can be approximated by the Rayleigh criteria. Uh, so 0.6 times the wavelength in microns divided by the numerical aperture of the objective. Uh, and for traditional IR and QCL type measurements, this wavelength is actually variable. And hence, if you plot this equation, you get a curve. So out here in the in the low wave number end of the spectrum, which is the long wavelength end, uh, your spatial resolution is much worse. And it gets better as you get to the short wavelength end. Uh, but with OPTIR, which is very similar to Raman, we have a we have a fixed um, beam, probe beam wavelength. 
uh, in this case 532, so plug that into here, uh, so whether it's a numerical aperture, you, you end up with 416 nanometers, and that's constant throughout the entire wavelength. I mean, that's where your up to 3630x improvement comes from. Okay, um, but one of our most exciting features is the fact that we can do infrared and run together. So these have been two complementary techniques that have been around together, often operating side by side, but never together and certainly never simultaneously. Uh, so now we can truly, get, truly claim same spot, same sub-micron resolution, all done at the same time. So it's pretty useful to go through a very simple schematic of the instrument. So it all starts, as I always say, with the QCL laser. Uh, that is shone through our objective and focused down. At the same time, we introduce that green um, propene collinearly, and that's also focused down to a tighter spot size. And this is where that sort of photothermal magic happens. The reflected light uh, comes back and goes on to a visible detector where our infrared signals are extracted. Uh, but the magic or the really novelty here, uh, and the simple novelty as well, is the fact that we use a Raman grade visible probing propane laser. So that means we've got Raman scattered photons here all the time. Whether we like it or not, whether we end up even using them or not, they're there. So we take advantage of the fact that Raman scattered photons are there by putting in a dichroic filter in here. So that's separating out those wavelength shifted and only those wavelength shifted photons. And that sends them off to our Raman spectrometer where we get out our Raman spectrum. Uh, and those unshifted photons will continue to the visual detector where we get our infrared beam. And thread spectrum rather, and so in, in this in this fashion we end up, and that's how we get that simultaneity, All right? So this really takes full advantage of the complementarity of IR and Raman. It's confirmatory as well. So your IR can confirm the Raman, uh, and the Raman confirms IR and vice versa. Okay, so um, in this second half of my half, I'll uh, quickly go through, as I said earlier on, um, some applications and applications overview. overview of uh, how and where OPTR is being used, based mostly on uh, publications out there. Uh, and speaking of publications, uh, it's always a thrill um, as, as, a, you know, as a proponent of the technique, as, as, a, as a product manager of the technique, to see uh, loads of publications, loads of academics using this group. And this is really the ultimate uh, vote of confidence is, is when scientists and, and their peers uh, are publishing uh, loads of papers. So we've started off in 2018, I think it was the first publications, and they've ramped up. Uh, so this is the latest uh, snapshot. It may be a little bit too small, but please do uh, jump onto our website and get a snapshot on where and how people are using our publications. Uh, and perhaps the biggest publication was late last year, and that was um, in, in Science Nanotechnology. And that had a massive impact after the 39. And this was actually a really, really thorough study. Uh, this is where they looked at uh, how uh, baby bottle teats or nickels, depending on in which country you call them, uh, how the steam sterilization, which was always thought to be really safe, actually isn't. Uh, it actually sheds a lot of silicon microplastics or microparticles. Uh, you end up etching the surface, uh, and, and, and through the unique capabilities of OPTR, they were really able to, able to dig in to that and, and look at the chemistry of, of the etched surfaces versus the unetched surfaces. Uh, they were even able to you know, pull out um, small particles that were as little as, uh, I think these are sort of 600 nanometers. It's actually a really, really good study. I'd recommend uh, everybody, anyone interested in having a good read of that one. Uh, and speaking of microplastics, uh, another recent uh, microplastics paper came out. Now this time, this was um, out of a group in, in China where they really, I think, nicely uh, compared and contrasted a uh, few common uh, vibrational spectroscopy techniques, so namely a QCL microscope-based technique, FTIR using a focal plane array detector, uh, and also Raman, which I'm not showing in this slide, uh, and then compared uh, some attributes, some quality attributes uh, from a spectral quality perspective as well. And I like this one because, in fact, this particular snippet from that paper, because uh, I think it really nicely uh, illustrate something that I harped on a lot early on, and that was this um, dispersive scatter artifacts issue, which we get with these uh, direct IR methods. So these are these QCL methods and um, FTIR based methods that detect infrared light directly. Um, and whenever you whenever you do that, uh, whenever you've got irregularly shaped particles or particles of varying shapes and sizes, even if they're all of the same chemistry, you see that the spectra are heavily dominated by the shape and morphology of the sample or the particle 
and not so much the chemistry of the sample. And you know, you, we're doing these techniques because we want insight into the chemistry, not the morphology. We can get the morphology from the visible pictures. But unfortunately, with these direct techniques, you get a lot of these wavelength dependent uh, dispersive scattering artifacts. And you can see, uh, you know, here is a reference uh, PET. Um, spectrum for what a, you know, a good quality PET spectrum should look like, and we see what it looks like uh, from a largish particle on, on an FTIR imaging-based system or from a you know, Q-cell-based system. And in this paper, they point out that PET was misidentified as, as an alkyl varnish. Um, and you know, just to give you an example of how OPTR looks in this perspective, this is the data from um, Curtis and Professor Kraft. Uh, you know, OPTIR spectra as I've said before, are very, very particle size and shape non-specific. So it really only explores the chemistry and there's no morphology um, involved into uh, the chemistry of, of, that, that, that the spectra represents. So OPTIR spectra, regardless of particle shape and size, will look like reference FTIR spectra. So um, I quite like this one. So I think it really um, illustrates that point nicely. Uh, we also had a, a new one come out just a few weeks ago. Um, out of out of Ferenc's uh, lab, in fact, or at least the users uh, came by his lab. Uh, and this was a cultural heritage example looking at um, metal and glass objects from a cultural heritage perspective. Um, and this is a, a novel result because doing this with a regular IR just wouldn't work. You, you, you can't take uh, such a rough material and then point an infrared beam at that and get uh, interpretable spectra back but well you can with OPTIR and so this is the spectra you get out of it uh, you, you see glass peaks you see four main carbonates um, and in this case they've done a small two-dimensional hyperspectral mapping exercise um, you know generated some maps uh, single point spectra from these points you can see and the spectra all here are pretty much uncorrected this is what you see you don't get these sort of dispersive uh, scattering artifacts uh, another hot off the press paper um, is one from uh, Roy Threddy's group at the University of Houston, where he couples uh, some polarization rotation uh, to look at uh, collagen orientation within tissues uh, as, as, an, as an added channel of information. In addition to the chemical distribution, it's also uh, you can get some garner some information from the orientation. Uh, and really, up until now, uh, FTIR has been used a lot. Uh, even some of these emerging QCL techniques, but they're always limited in their resolution. You can see between A between A and B here, there's a huge difference in resolution between FTIR and OPTIR. And if we in fact zoom in, we can actually look at these individual one micron collagen fibers, which FTIR cannot see, but you can see with OPTIR. Right? Um, and then on this far right column here, uh, they've looked at the AMY2 to AMY1 ratios as a function of different polarization angles. Uh, and, and this is what the spectra look like as well. So we've got glass, and this is actually on glass, and that's another real benefit of this technique is that you can use glass as a substrate. Um, and when you're interested in these AMO1 and AMO2 ratios, um, it's really quite simple through, it's all software controlled polarization ratios, ratio changes. Um, one from probably 2020 now, another high impact factor journal looking at neurons uh, and looking at um, protein secondary structure differences in neurons. Um, this is, I, like, I like this figure because it's really showing the incredible resolution even down to sort of 282 nanometers and how between those you actually get real chemical differences indicating in this case more uh, beta sheet structures in one of, one of those points. Uh, very quickly, this was a polymer example looking at a biodegradable polymer laminate, a PLA and a PHA layer. The laminated, uh, interested at what's happening at the surface, at the interface rather. So we can do a simple uh, one-dimensional line, line array or linear or line array of that, uh, collecting OPTIR and Raman spectra simultaneously. If we just focus on the um, OPTIR data, uh, Across that interface, all of these spectra here are separated by only 100 nanometers. You can see, even with 100 nanometer steps, you see strong chemical differences. Um, and taking single frequencies of those at 1725 and 1760, we get a, 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 an image that you'd expect. Um, but taking uh, a line profile across here, uh, we can see how sharp that edge is around 327. And that what I show it here through some of the 2D correlation data analysis that have worked out that. The reason why these two layers are actually quite compatible when they're 
expected not to be is the fact that the PHA at this interface when in contact with PLA is actually a lot more amorphous and, there's, and, and thus it's a lot more compatible with the already quite amorphous PLA layer. Uh, this is a really good example to show of where when Raman fails, OPTIR will not and cannot. So this is a forensic application looking at a paint chip cross-section from a sort of a vehicle accident, I think it was. Uh, so single point spectra were taken in these red, blue, and green dots at these three different layers. And the Raman, this is the, the simultaneously collected Raman. Uh, so if there's fluorescence, of course, even the, the, the Raman channel uh, on our instrument will still show, show fluorescence, as it did in this case with the red and the green, uh, the blue uh, works. Uh, but even when the even in the red and green spots, the OPTIR spectra are completely uh, unaffected by fluorescence. Uh, fibers are, are an interesting example because they're actually quite difficult with traditional IR and QCL measurements. Uh, in this case, we've been able to collect high quality spectra, again, without any uh, data processing. This is, these are raw spectra, as you can see, uh, evolving on the screen. And along the length of this fiber, we can see that there are additives that are changing along the length. But whether it's a 20 micron fiber or an 800 nanometer fiber, the spectra still look like interpretable, uh, recognizable spectra. Uh, very quickly, this is a phase dispersion. Um, I like this one because when you zoom in and do a really high resolution step image, uh, you can see some incredibly small features. Um, and spectra on and off these hotspots look like, as you might expect, and you roll it. And this, this is a ratio image, by the way, it's 1759 uh, and 1733. And we can see where the, ratio, where the um, contrast in these images are, originate from. If we zoom through that one, uh, so even some of these small ones can be in a sort of a couple hundred odd nanometer region. Um, cells in water are actually relatively easy with this technique. This is a cheek cell in water example, a cheek cell uh, placed into a calcium fluoride slide with a calcium fluoride cover slip on top. Uh, when I collected, this is actually one that, one that I did myself, when I collected some single point spectra from around the cell, um, I saw that there were some lipid features, there were some nucleic acid features, and of course protein is quite ubiquitous. Um, and when I collect a single frequency image on those three uh, wavelengths alone and, and combine them together in this IGB overlay, lo and behold, it actually looks like a stunning, almost fluorescent-like image where you can see uh, very small lipid droplets and nucleic acid, of course, concentrated in the center. And some of these are sort of half a micron uh, in size. Um, in terms of particular examples, especially in the context of, of microplastics, this, I think, is a really powerful example showing of how 500 nanometer polystyrene beads are measured in seconds simultaneously with infrared and Raman. Right, so here, this is, this is in red, we have the OPTR spectrum. In green, I should label these. In green, we have these, in, we have this is the Raman. So again, half a micron bead measured in seconds. But whether it's a half a micron bead or a cluster of, of two micron beads, the spectrum look the same. There are no dispersive scattering artifacts. So OPTR generates repeatable spectra that are independent of particle shape and size or sample sample graphics. Okay. Uh, study out of the, um, the Andy Alt group uh, in Michigan, looking at atmospheric particles, uh, where he used both infrared and Raman. Um, Kathy Goff out of um, uh, University of Manitoba in Canada looked at collagen orientation again, taking advantage of the inherent polarized nature of, of Q cells and rotating the polarization. Um, I'm going to just quickly go through these. These are these the half micron uh, collagen fibrils um, where the amon one amon 2 ratios are changed quite a fair bit depending on the polarization orientation. I'm going to flip it through those. Uh, these were um, cancerous and normal cells on glass that we were able to differentiate. Um, based solely on their OPTIR spectra, again, on glass. So this is very clinically translatable. Uh, and, and just to give you a sense of the quality of the spectra that they obtain, so these, these are single scans, about one second each. You see, you see some glass, of course, because they're on glass. But the rest of the spectrum is super high quality, half a micron spot, no processing whatsoever. Uh, and you can do you know, lipid chain length images with you take these ratios or lipid to proteins uh, and obtain some you know, pretty stunning images, I think. Um, live cell imaging. This is a, a paper out of Peter Gardner Group in Manchester where they compared fixed and live cells uh, doing simultaneous IR and Raman. Uh, and of course, you know, this sort of work is quite difficult with regular FTI because you're going to use a seven micron path length cell, which is incredibly difficult to work with. 
but here they use a sort of upside down sort of configuration where the cell is actually sitting upside down so that the IR light hits it first, doesn't have to go through all that water. Uh, and then we measure the probe being actually in transmission mode. So that was a study that worked out quite well. I think this is my final um, example, uh, looking at back, single bacteria. Uh, up until now, the only chance of doing single bacteria would have been with, with the Raman microscope, but now in the infrared, you can do single bacteria as well. And, and they've, they've actually now upgraded to Raman, so they can do infrared and Raman on single bacteria. Uh, but in this example, they had, uh, well, they, they, they fed the bacteria in different isotopes of carbon and nitrogen. Uh, that greatly shifts the AM1-1 and AM2 ratios. Uh, and from, through some sophisticated analysis of that, a lot can be gleaned about the uh, metabolic pathways of these of these cells. Uh, it's an example of a E. coli cell that's been measured, imaged at 50 nanometer step sizes, just a simple uh, AM1-1 image, uh, and even in an intracellular uh, spectra from a single bacterium uh, shown here as well. Um, and this was a starlet region chip, so we've actually got some CD absorbances because these E. coli were uh, grown in, in heavy water, partial heavy water. And I think my final example here is of a, a simultaneous IR and Raman spectrum of a single E. coli bacteria. So you can see the collection time here is about a minute. Um, IR spectra, really high quality. Raman, decent quality, but of course Raman is always, um, will always lag behind when it comes to uh, signal noise, but for the first time now we can collect infrared and Raman from single bacteria, uh, which I think is pretty exciting. Uh, I'm going to quickly move on to my uh, little takeaways, my conclusions. Um, by combining infrared well, well, with OPTIR, we can get submicron inflation, so you see a lot more detail. It's non contact, it's reflection mode, so there's no cross contamination, the preparation is easy. No dispersive scattering artifacts, so the spectra are insensitive. insensitive to sample shape and size and only sensitive to the chemistry, which is really, of course, what we care about at the, at the end of the day. Uh, little to no sample prep, uh, new new few cell options, uh, expanding the range of, of applications. Uh, and we've also recently added the ability to add a fluorescence module on the top, so you can actually do co-located OPTIR and Raman based off fluorescence images. Uh, and I'll finish off by saying IR plus Raman, it's all about the same spot, same time, same resolution. And that brings me to the end of my half. Uh, that should leave roughly about half of the allotted time to Professor Howard Hogan. Uh, so I'm going to hand over to him uh, for uh, the main act, as I always call this. Uh, Harvard, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very kind um, introduction, uh, Mustafa. And thank you very much for allowing me to present some of our data at this uh, webinar. The, the talk what I would present today is could intrinsic disorder peptides improve bone uh, formation? My name is uh, Howard Hogan. I'm a professor of biomaterial at the Institute of Clinical Dentistry at the University of Oslo. Um, this study has been recently uh, published in a uh, paper and materials today. Uh, I will focus uh, now this study on mostly on the um, OPTR uh, version of it. So there's a lot more information, so if you're interested, uh, you're welcome to download for free um, what we've done in this study in this recent materials today uh, paper. A little bit of the background, but I'm not sure all of you uh, know too much about bone. Bone has a tremendous regenerative uh, capacity. It's a tissue that is highly uh, vascularized and has a lot of multipotent uh, cells. That means that have cells that can, could transform into anything. And that means that it has uh, a high regenerative capacity. And I'm sure a lot of you that listen to the audience have maybe fallen off a bike or a tree when they were younger and they had uh, their bone into a plaster and they saw that after uh, a couple of weeks of, uh, of healing, the bone went, uh, went fine. And this is one of the beauty where, with bone, that it actually is able to, to heal itself. And here, if you have these kind of, kind of fractures, it's not very uh, complicated and is not too difficult to treat. But unfortunately, there is a lot of other trauma that happened to bone, and then you cannot just put a plaster around it to try to uh, heal the defect. And this will be, for instance, if you have a, a, a femur and you have a part of the missing bone, 
this kind of defect will not heal by itself. Or uh, from one, one of our patients in, uh, in, in our clinic, missing a lot of uh, bone around the jaw, this is also a thing that will not heal by itself. Or bone missing around the tooth, these are also things that it's uh, difficult. And the problem also with bone that it's depending on your health and your mobility, and so you actually you need to give uh, bone some help to grow in these kind of situation. So how do you do that? Well, you can apply a porous structure that we call a scaffold or a bone graft, which is a, a porous material that we could put into this uh, defect and where bone cell grow into this uh, porous uh, structure. Sometimes the bone cells are growing a little bit too slow into this structure. So that's why um, one of my research topic is uh, how can I try to improve uh, the healing so that bone go quicker and better in healing. It's just an enlargement of uh, these bone graft materials, how you would see it if it is a 3D printed material. So what I would like to uh, talk today is how can I increase the bioactivity of such bone graft or scaffolds? Um, to try to find a good alternative, we went back to the uh, literature and we're looking at different proteins and how nature is doing it. And just trying to cut a long story short, we did some in silico uh, modeling and then we came up with uh, some peptide sequence that um, supposed to be promising in terms of healing bone. Um, we also ran some in silico modeling and that showed that one of these sequences is supposed to be a lot better than an, uh, another sequence, even though the sequences are quite similar. So the hypothesis that we set up in this, this paper was that uh, one of these peptides should work a little bit better than the other one, even though the structure are very similar, they behave very differently in the in silico modeling. So we added these peptides into the uh, bone graft and we had an anima model and then it would place inside a um, calvaric bone and then we let it heal for a certain amount of time and then we uh, took out the material and then we investigated the bone. This is the head of a, uh, of a pig and these are the defects where you can see from day zero that um, they're not, uh, of course they're not closed because they're uh, just bone graft just been placed. Then after eight weeks and 16 weeks we see a closure where we have uh, these uh, scaffolds and also quicker if we have these peptide present. Of course, this is a very crude uh, image. So we cannot just say by looking at this uh, CBCT uh, that we got a proper healing. We run a multiple um, test, both in the terms of micro CT, immunohistochemistry, uh, histology and sex and, and, and wax uh, data. Due to timeline, I will not able to present everything here today in terms of the uh, biology, so I'll just give you a snapshot. And what you can see here are micro CT images that quantify at a much higher resolution uh, the amount of bone in these small uh, round areas. They are, uh, these bone grafts were about 16 millimeters in diameter. And what we uh, see is that indeed the in silico modeling uh, was correct that one of the peptide produced uh, more bone uh, than the bone graft without this peptide. And um, the one that we call P2 had a lot more bone than, than the P6, even though uh, they were quite similar in terms of the structure. When we submitted uh, this uh, work to the uh, materials today, uh, we got a harsh review and because it's not easy to publish in these high impact journals. And uh, they asked us, how do we really know that the uh, effect that was, uh, we saw was just because of the, of the P2? How can we really um, prove that the mineralization was enabled uh, by this P2 and not by, uh, by P6. Uh, so we had to give a proof that not just the in silico was working, and even though we had a lot of immunohistochemistry data and histology and other data, 
we had to show that we had a bone right next to this uh, peptide. So we went back to the lab and we tried to look at some of the instruments that we had uh, in our lab to look at it. And we thought the first thing we, we would uh, use is trying to use some infrared spectroscopy because we know that the peptide has some amine bonds and we know the bone has some phosphate bonds. So it should be possible to use uh, our IR instrument to look at it. So we tried our ATR FDR, but it failed because of the low resolution. We also have a um, FDR uh, microscope. Uh, this also failed. It was too noisy and the resolution uh, was not high enough. So we were not able to, uh, to answer this question. So the next thing that we went to try was that, okay, we need, still need the IR, but we need to have a much, much higher resolution that I could have in, uh, in the lab. So we went to um, some colleagues and we tried some atomic force microscope infrared spectroscopy because this should work because it has a very, very high resolution at the top tip of the material. You probably know this technique that you have a, a cantilever I'm showing right here and then showing this with a, with a laser and then right on this dot where it meets the surface, you can get the IR signal. And the resolution here, you can get down to about uh, 20 nanometer. And then you can see here from the images, these are different spots where we have bone and these different colors are the different IR signals that we tried to uh, pick up. So in theory, the AFM IR should be an ideal uh, to look at these uh, sample because it has the uh, high resolution. But the problem that we accounted was that uh, the slices that we made when we uh, cut the samples with the bone, they were too rough. And the roughnesses of these surfaces was interfering with this very, very fine tip. So even though we got some, some phosphate signals and some uh, amine signals, uh, we could not really tell the difference between the P2 and P6. So we're still not able to answer the questions from this journal how can we say that the P2 enables mineralization and not? And luckily, we got in touch um, with Phototermal that showed us this new technique that we would uh, try. So we went on and uh, tried to, to investigate whether these uh, peptides conformal changes and biomineralization would be possible to, uh, by using the optical Phototermal infrared uh, Raman. And you know that the, uh, the resolution is a lot improving from the ATR and the FDR that I tried in my lab, but it has a resolution around uh, five microns, the OPTR go down to 0 0.5. So then the question was if this is enough to look at bone samples. So let's see what we found out. Here is a overlaying uh, scan from the um, OPTR is a uh, ratio of two different uh, frequencies, 137 and uh, 1660, which is the one from the amine bond and one from the, uh, from the phosphate. So this actually uh, shows the, um, the region where it's rich in, in minerals. In essence, what I can say from this image is that here I have bone and here out here, I do not have bone. And now the big question is, if I have a lot of bone in uh, this sample, can I see uh, P2 and can I see the conformational changes um, that the in silico modeling that I did uh, told me that would happen? So let's see what happened. Oh yeah, here, there's another uh, zoom in where we looked at a little bit, a uh, little bit closer at a, a smaller uh, nodule. And we see that we can actually able to see small bone nodules down to uh, a couple of microns using this imaging technology from the uh, OPTR. This is a image where we see different spectra from different spots. So you remember from the early image that this is the, uh, the mineral rich area. So the um, here and out here are uh, not mineral rich area. And these blue dots, those are the uh, blue images here. 
and the uh, the red dots, those are represented by the red spectras here. And you can clearly see that I have a lot of phosphates group. This is the uh, phosphate peaks right here. So the the, P, the phosphate peak here uh, corresponds here. And you see a high rise in the in the phosphates. And finally, what we managed to show is that if we have a high phosphate peak, we also have a high amine peak, which is a proof that we actually have um, the peptide involved when we have the phosphate. If you look at region where there is no bone, so out here and out here, see the phosphate signal is uh, almost gone. And you can also see that there's hardly any of the peptide present. So this image actually proved that once I have a mineralization, I would have more of the, of the P2 present. And if you look very closely to this figure, you can also see that there's a little bit shoulder. And this also gave me an indication that uh, this peptide, which is an intrinsic disorder uh, peptide, has gone into a beta shape uh, formed and done some conformational changes. We also went and did a line scan through the material. The one that previous we just done on random spots. And here I did a, a line scan through the material where I start off where there's no bone and I go into where there's bone and then I go out again. And again, we see the, exactly the same picture. So as I'm moving towards into my bone, I get a much, much, much stronger uh, phosphate uh, signal. And I can also see that the peptide is getting more and more present. It's unstructured out here in this, in this region. And I get a, a beta sheet uh, structure once the mineral is present. So indeed, with this technique, we actually managed to solve the questions from the reviewer that uh, when I have P2, I have uh, more bone and it, the conformational changes, and it fits with the in silico modeling. How does it look like for the other peptides? With the uh, P6, which in silico modeling said that we should bring less bone, when we do the same uh, overview uh, image, I saw less larger domains of the, uh, of the mineral when compared to the uh, P2. The box here is a just image that present then uh, a zoomed in. So we will zoom in and we will look in at this, uh, this image here in the next uh, slide. So here as well, with the overlaying of 137 and, and 1660 uh, in, in wavelength, you can see that we have uh, less mineral rich. And then also let's see if we're able to de detect some of the peptides inside this, uh, this mineral. And again, uh, we did some uh, scans around uh, different areas. So this is the same zoomed in area. And uh, these spots here is where we have the mineral and the other spots are where we have less mineral. And you can clearly see here that we still see the phosphate peak. So we still have some of the phosphate, but the presence of the peptide is a lot less. So we have less phosphates, we have less of the, um, of the peptides, and we have less beta, structure, uh, beta sheet structure, just what the in silico modeling told us. So if I try to summarize what we were able to do with this uh, OPTR uh, technique is that we were able to show that these uh, P2 peptide and the uh, beta sheet form uh, formation is when you have uh, mineralization. If we look at the other peptide that is supposed to be quite similar, but uh, was very different in all the biological uh, uh, essays that we looked at, we saw less of the peptide and we did not see any conformational changes. And these conformational changes, we were not able to see in any other, other technique. You probably saw earlier from the um, AR that we could maybe see some amine peaks, but to look at these conformational changes would have been uh, impossible because we were not able to differentiate between the different, uh, different peaks. So to, uh, to conclude, I can show that uh, entering disorder peptides where this uh, peptide belong to can stimulate both early and late bone healing and bone mineralization. 
And I can definitely say that OPTR is a very promising imaging tool to study uh, bone mineralization and peptide at very high resolution. And I can also say that this IDP was a one-to-many signaling uh, molecule. I did not do all this work uh, by myself. There was a large team uh, in Europe and US that was helping out. And I would particularly uh, point out uh, Mariam now at John Hopkins and Camilla at Gesacht in, in Hamburg and the group in uh, University of Washington that was very uh, helpful. And of course, Eogan at uh, Santa Barbara that was performing all these uh, OPTR measurements for us. And I'd also like to acknowledge uh, funding, MagSafe, uh, Horizon 2020, uh, NIH grant uh, from the US, uh, Reka Eurostar grant, um, Smartphone PEP, and National Nature Science Foundation from China for helping out with the study. Thank you very much, and then I'll be very happy to answer any of the questions that might arise. I think I'll go back to the these images because this is what I like. Yeah, so if you have any questions, uh, please just uh, type it in in your uh, chat and then I'll try to answer this question as best as possible. Great, thank you, uh, Hubbard. Um, I've, been, I've been listening carefully. It looks like others have been listening carefully just based on the number of questions that have been coming in. So I'm gonna try and get these out as quickly as I can. Um, I think this first one here, I'm gonna throw your way. It says, uh, yes. This technique substitute histology or other imaging techniques? David. I would not say that it would substitute because I still would need to do those other techniques to uh, prove what's going on in on the enzymatic level and the biochemical uh, level. But it gives me a lot more uh, data and give me a much clearer picture. And I have not come across any other technique that could give me uh, these, uh, this kind of data. Uh, so I think it's an extremely promising technique in order to reveal uh, a lot more what is happening at bone and material uh, interface. This is both able to pick up uh, organic signals and uh, phosphate signals from, uh, from bone. So I think we will learn a lot more by using this technology uh, in my line of research. Okay, thank you. And I'll move on to the next one. In fact, this is actually my question that I wrote out. Um, I don't usually ask questions <laughs> in these. Um, I saw you did, uh, so you did, so you tried some FTAI microscopy. Uh, what mode was it done in? Did you say it was quite noisy? Uh, with, with the, they, were both, they were done in, in transmission uh, mode. Okay. And the problem is that we just uh, we just didn't get any sort of clear images, and we didn't really go down to the to the spot size as well, because we really needed to differentiate where we had sort of uh, not bone and where we actually had bone, uh, and that was not not able with that other uh, other technique. And then I'm also very disappointed that I'm not getting any better images with the uh, AFM uh, IR as well. I mean, it's extremely time-consuming technique and takes a lot of time to uh, to prepare. And I really thought I would get a lot of information, you know, from a single spot from the AFM IR, but I was very disappointed. And then I was equally surprised that I would get so much better images by using this this technique. Yeah. I think you, you mentioned- Because you state that it sort of had a resolution of 0 0.5, but you know, it's definitely enough resolution to see the bone nodules and what's happening between when bone is forming and bone is not, not forming. Yeah, you know, I think the issues you mentioned there with AFM probably tie into this next question here, which is, you know, what sort of roughness is tolerable with OPTIR? So, uh, you know, with OPTIR, it kind of depends on what you're doing. If you're doing single point spectroscopy, like just sort of point by point you know, exploring or even a hyperspectral, uh, roughness is really not an issue. It could be several microns, it could be very, very rough. Uh, if you are doing single frequency imaging, uh, as you know, as you've shown here as well, uh, because the, the single frequency imaging is, is done on a single Z or Z plane, uh, there's no uh, focus adjustment in single frequency because you're, you're scanning the sample quite fast. There, the sample roughness should be within the sort of one to two micron, just to stay within the uh, focal volume or focal depth of the objective. But we know that, of course, with AFM, they kind of have to be sort of nanometer smooth, uh, you know, roughness or smoothness. 
of course, I'm sure with Bone, that's you know, almost or virtually impossible. Um, mm. Next one, I'll throw your way. Uh, can you use this yes. cell culture and single cells and organoid research? I definitely think so. Now, I think th this would be a very interesting uh, field to try to look at mineralization in, in cell culture and uh, and with other type of growth factors, other type of uh, peptides as well. Um, I think that would be a very interesting field to uh, start looking at in vitro work with this uh, technique, uh, yeah, especially in uh, organoids. We have more sort of complex structures, but also more simple uh, cell cultures where you have um, mineral uh, deposition and you want to prove some kind of effect of um, some kind of uh, reagent that you can actually follow both the mineralization and, and the cell and the thing at the same at the same time. And there's probably a lot more applications that I just can't think of at the top of my, my head that would be uh, very useful. Okay, what's next on this? I think we're okay for time. Uh, it says, how does OPTA not suffer from fluorescence if you're using a Raman laser? Oh, well, I'll take that one. Uh, the trick to getting around fluorescence issues, which are obviously issues with, with Raman, is with OPTIR, the infrared laser is pulsed. So your, your green signal, the reflected light amplitude that we're measuring, is modulated. Now, fluorescence is not modulated. It's only the infrared information that's contained within that green signal is modulated. So we use a locking amplifier to only extract out the modulated component, which is the part that contains the infrared information. Hence, you could have the world's most fluorescent sample or the world's least fluorescent sample. It would make absolutely zero difference for the OPTIR. Of course, the simultaneous Raman channel uh, that we have on our microscope is, is equally susceptible uh, to fluorescence as any other sort of traditional standalone Raman microscope. Um, yeah, and maybe I can comment on as well because these these samples these were embedded into um, PMMA, so when there were uh, cuts, then of course we could not use uh, the Raman signal because all the Raman signals were absorbed in the in the MMA, and the reason why we had to do that was because the tissues were quite hard. But if I had to embed my samples in in paraffin uh, instead, then I could have taken out, you know, very easily uh, the paraffin from my samples, and then I could have done, uh, gotten Raman signals here and <clears throat> known a lot more about the the bone structures. But luckily here for us, uh, the IR signal was so good that we could, I could still show, see the uh, the phosphate peaks. But if I had to deplasticize my samples or to remove the the paraffin, then I I could have gotten a Rama signal and getting a lot more information out of it. And that, back to this cell culture, that is, is another thing that would be very nice to look at biomineralization in, in a cell culture, because then there wouldn't be any issues with a uh, fixation in MMA or paraffin. All right, thank you for that. I think we're now uh, reaching the end of our of our allotted time. Uh, there are a few more questions which we haven't been able to get to. So, um, and then any more that comes through, we will respond to our email within the next few days or maybe up to a week. I uh, once again I want to thank everybody for their time and I would especially you for your time. I know how busy you are. Uh, now, the, this webinar has been recorded and will be available on our website within a couple of days. So, um, in fact, we'll send out an email uh, to that effect, which I'm hoping you could you know, forward on to anyone else that you think might be interested. Um, and with that, I think uh, I will close the webinar. Once again, thank you to everybody. Bye, bye everyone. Yes, thank you for listening and thank you for allowing me to present. <laughs> thank you. Bye. -bye.